Hello, my name is Carlise Anderson. I'm a policy fellow with Sister Reach and I will be your moderator today. I would like to welcome all of you to reproductive justice polling in the South, but Black women think in Tennessee and Kentucky. This is a conversation that is led by Black women for Black women and to be used as a tool to share information and discuss reproductive justice issues that addresses Black women healthcare concerns and provide policy guidance to legislators in Kentucky and other states in the Deep South. I would like to thank you all for joining us. Today's programming is being brought to you by Sister Reach, an organization based in Memphis, Tennessee, whose mission is to empower Black women, femmes, LGBTQ+, teens of color, and other underserved populations to lead lives, raise healthy families, and live in healthy and sustainable communities by using a three-pronged strategy of education, policy and advocacy, and culture change and in our own voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda, which is a national organization initiative that is designed to amplify and lift up the voices of Black women at the national and regional levels in our ongoing fight to secure reproductive justice for all women and girls. This webinar continues our series of polling briefings as we expand our base of engagement and influence across the Deep South and paint a picture of what Black women really think about political issues that are impacting our bodies, families, and lives. This webinar series centers the voices, experiences, and views of Black women in Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas, and is used to bring visibility to the data that centers our political views about what Black women really think about reproductive justice, health rights, and other issues. In our own voice, polling data analyzes the apprehensions and sentiments of Black women. It's important to note that this conversation is rare. Research and polling data on Black women seldomly occur, and it is our goal at In Our Own Voice to provide real data for communities whose lives are affected the most by policymakers. We want our local, state, and federal officials to hear our cry, our voices, to understand our concerns, and most importantly, to review real data that will generate policy and structural change that will allow Black women to live more abundant lives, raise healthy families, and do so while living in an educated and safe community. We thank you for tuning into this webinar to discuss the disproportionate health disparities and reproductive oppressions that our communities continue to experience, especially in the time of coronavirus. There's a lot at stake. We will continue to express our concerns and our priorities as we navigate through systemic racism, this global pandemic, and an ongoing assault against black and brown people by police. Today, we will be joined by Marcella Howe, the founder and president of In Our Own Voice, who will present the polling data for Kentucky. After Marcella's presentation, we will segue into a discussion informed by this data, beginning with remarks from Cherise Scott, founder and CEO of Sister Reach, Representative Attica Scott of Kentucky, representing the Jefferson part of Kentucky, Aaron Smith from, excuse me, Aaron Smith from Kentucky's Health Justice Network, and Michelle Hayes, a reproductive justice advocate and lawyer from the ACLU Kentucky. Thank you all for being here today. Before the start of the presentation, I want to go over a few housekeeping rules. We anticipate that you may have questions regarding the data, so we will reserve a 10 minute time slot for questions. During the presentation, however, the chat box will be disabled on Zoom. If you are watching via Facebook, you may post questions during that time through the comment section. Now let's get into the data that brought us all here. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker, Marcella Howe, who will present the polling results. Thank you, Charis. Um, I wanna welcome and I thank everybody for, uh, for signing up and coming to this webinar. As uh, Carlise mentioned, the polling data that we did encompassed seven states, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Kentucky, Tennessee, and, and Texas. And so we're gonna to talk today about just Kentucky. And I wanna say that a number of questions were asked specifically about abortion rights because we were looking at this at, uh, because of all of the kind of attacks that have gone on at the state level about abortion access. But we also asked questions about economic questions, about racism, about um, over-policing and other kinds of issues. First slide. The, um, we asked questions of 500 black women ages 18 and up in each state. 
And in Kentucky, 69% of those uh, respondents were actual voters. Next. Interesting enough, in Kentucky, the, the Black population is only 8% of uh, the Kentucky population. And 50% of that are Black women and girls. A majority of the respondents we asked said that they did not want to see Roe v. Wade overturned. In fact, 80% of them said that. And it's very important that we look at that considering that right now the United States Senate is considering a new person to put on the Supreme Court who has been very, very vocal about her opposition to Roe v. Wade. So we're going to ask some questions. We're going to talk about some of the data from, from uh, what people said about wanting to make sure that the 1973 Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade that established a women's constitutional rights to have an abortion is still intact. And 80%, as I said, of respondents, Black women in Kentucky said that they wanted to make sure that Roe v. Wade stayed intact. Next, 96% of those women also said that they saw a woman's ability to control her childbearing as an important aspect of financial security. In terms of financial security in Kentucky, 29% of black families living in Kentucky live in poverty. 76% of those Black families living in poverty are headed by single women. And surprisingly, 85% of Black women have either high school diplomas or more education. So it is not an issue around their education level that um, is a predominant issue around poverty. Next. But it is, however, an issue around what Black women make in terms of uh, their wages in relationship to what a white man makes. In fact, in Kentucky, Black women earn only 67 cents for every dollar that a white person make, a white male makes, which means, of course, that for Black women, there is a lifetime loss of $597,500 and $20, a half a million dollars because the wages are low. And in fact, for a black woman to make as much money as a white man who retires at 65, she would have to work until she is 80 years old. We also asked black women, what were the kinds of factors that factored into their decision about whether or not to become a parent or to um, have additional children. And what they said was 64% said racism was a factor. 62% said access to a living wage job was a factor. 58% said affordable health care and affordable housing factored into that. 56% said food security. And when we look at the issues going on with COVID-19 right now, food security is a very big issue for all communities across this country. 53% said childhood, childcare access was a big factor in making decisions about whether or not to start a family. And 46% said that over-policing was a factor. In fact, when we asked them a little bit more questions, 54% said that racism has a negative effect on their mental and emotional health. 37% said racism has a negative impact on their physical health. And then when we asked a question of younger Black women between the ages of 18 and 34, 59% of them said that racism had a, a mental and emotional impact on their lives. So when you look at it, 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 it becomes really important when you look at from older women, 
over the ages of 35 and up and what younger women, women are saying in their everyday life. Next. We asked the question about over-policing in Kentucky. 46% of the respondents said that over-policing factored into their decision about having a child. However, younger women, 18 to 34, said that 64% of them said that over-policing factored into decisions about having a child. That means, can you go back to that slide? When you look at it, how the impact on younger women who are the ones who usually come into contact with police and are sometimes subjected to over-policing, it is very important that we look at the fact that 64% of them, a high majority said that over-policing impacted their decisions about whether or not to bring children into this world. We also asked questions specifically about how they would like to have, for people seeking an abortion, what would these women want their abortion experience to be like? 82% said they would want services to be affordable. 81% said they would also like services to be simple and that they would like people to respect their decision. So when they went into clinics, they would want to have their decision greeted with respect from people who were in the clinics. They also said that 80% um, of them said that they would like to have abortion services available in their community. And then 71% said that they would like those services to be available as soon as possible so that there were not delays such as some states have imposed on um, women in terms of making them wait 24 to 48 to 72 hours in order to get services for abortion. We also asked them about um, whether or not they knew if abortion was legal in Kentucky. And what was interesting about it is 47%, less than half, said that they felt that they believed that right now abortion was legal in Kentucky. 17% said that they, that they did not think abortion was legal in Kentucky. And what was fascinating was that a third, 35%, were unsure about the legal status of abortion rights in their state. When we asked them about whether or not abortion was at risk in Kentucky, 69% said that they felt that abortion was at risk in the country. And in fact, 30% said that, that they thought it was fairly secure. And then 65% of the respondents said that they thought that abortion was at risk in their state, in the state of Kentucky. Um, and then another 48%, 48% said that they thought that abortion rights, uh, getting abortion services was becoming harder in Kentucky, while 10% said that it was becoming easier and 39% felt that abortion access was not changing. So you see the vast majority believing that abortion is at risk both in the United States as a whole and also in the state of Kentucky as well. We asked people about who should be involved in making a decision about abortion and 65% of the respondents in Kentucky said that the woman or the person involved should be able to make the decision about how and when to access abortion services, not lawmakers. They also said that 63% of them said that they would be more likely to support candidates who supported their rights to have access to abortion services. Next. And in fact, in terms of supporting abortion, 65% of the respondents said that they did not believe abortion was a religious issue for them. 81% said that they felt that seeking an abortion in their circumstances 
was a responsible choice. And 83% said that they would reject anyone trying to shame them because they were seeking what was a constitutional right to abortion. So those are the, the stats from our polling. And as I said, that a lot of factors factor into someone deciding they wanted to have an abortion that are wide range from economic issues to issues around racism to issues around over-policing in their communities. So I'm gonna turn this over to um, Carlise to introduce the panel and to have that discussion. Thank you, Marcella, for highlighting these important findings. We will now move into discussion with our panelists, Cherise Scott, Representative Attica Scott, Aaron Smith, and Michelle Hayes to give their perspectives on how this data is important to Black women, FEMS, and the communities that they are a part of in the South. We will hear responsive remarks from each panelist and a discussion will follow. Each speaker will have three minutes to briefly respond to how they believe this polling data reflects the community of Kentucky and the effect that it has on their and our collective political organizing and advocacy work. Cherise, we know that there is a systemic link between social economic status and access to reproductive health. Underserved communities are impacted by barriers to basic healthcare services, such as annual visits with a gynecologist, maternal and abortion health care, LGBTQ plus care, and standard comprehensive information about their reproductive health. Can you tell us a little bit about how Black women and women of color living with comparatively low incomes are impacted by the healthcare disparities? Sure, uh, but before I answer that question, I want to go back words and just respond to what we just heard um, and give some remarks on that first. And then I'm definitely uh, happy to answer the question, which really is all going to segue uh, into each other for me. But I think that as a Black woman and, and, and the other Black women and people on this call understand that we are all making decisions about our reproductive and sexual health based on the environments in which we live, uh, whether or not we feel supported to make those decisions, whether or not we've got access access to uh, proper health care, if our social conditions are appropriate, if our, our family conditions are appropriate. Um, some things that really jumped out to me that I think is aligns itself and with what's happening uh, in the Southeast and, and understanding that one of the reasons that it was important for us to make sure that there was polling data up for states that touch the state of Tennessee is to, to make this kind of continuation conversation about the ways in which uh, Black women in particular and people who give birth are making decisions uh, of if and when to have a child or not to have a child. Um, and, and even in connecting that to the whole kind of purpose of reproductive justice started by 12 Black women in 1994, they had three main focuses, right? And one was to ensure that healthcare would be comprehensive, that, uh, that it would meet the whole person's needs, including their mental, behavioral, preventive, and interventive needs, that they would have protection from discrimination, uh, and that they and that it would uh, be a healthcare package that would be inclusive of all women across the spectrum and folks who give birth. And so to know that even in Kentucky, we, we're seeing some very uh, similar statistics as what we're seeing across, especially the Southeast, where we're having a small population of Black people, where Black women are leading the, the, their households more than not, and are having to make decisions about having children or not having children based on their economic well-being, based on uh, feeling that they, whether or not they are safe. Uh, one of the things that I've, you know, in the, in the 15 years that I've had the opportunity to do this work, in 2015, when we put up uh, a response billboard to um, anti-abortion billboards that were targeting Black men and, um, and shaming Black women, even here in Memphis, uh, one of the things that I said in an in a interview was that Black women making decisions about having uh, an abortion, was, it was an act of love for many of us. It wasn't uh, an act of shame or, or something that we were just making a flippant decision about because we recognize, especially in a state like 
like Kentucky, the state where Breonna Taylor laid her head, the state where she was murdered in her sleep, the state where she still did not get any uh, real justice as far as the, you know, what that response looks like on the other side for police officers who took her life. Uh, what we recognize is for many of us, knowing that we're navigating a life and, and the uh, and the impact of the lives that we are leading can still lead to a result that ends in us not getting justice. We're choosing not to have our children, even if we want to have our kids, right? So I think that the narrative has been framed that Black women don't want to have children, that we're, we're shiftless, that the welfare queen narrative has continued, that we're we're not interested in being wives, that we're not interested uh, in, in the longevity and legacies of our family and our lineage. And that's not necessarily true. If these statistics show, we the polling data is, is in right there in black and white, that not only do black women want to be parents, but we're not making decisions to have our children because we can't afford to have our children. If we're going to have 67% on the dollar that a white man would make, and yet we are expected not to be able you know, to be at home when kids get home, fitting some type of a, of a trope, uh, you know, this is not leave it to be, but black women got to get up, we got to go to work when we're ill. Black women are making decisions to live and die, and, you know, and many times to die in order to make sure that their children uh, are taken care of. And so I think that that's something that we really got to uh, be honest about. I think it's important to, uh, to lift up the fact that um, that uh, not only is the wage gap an issue, but that racism is a, a very important factor in the ways that Black women are having children or choosing not to have children. And the fact that the Kentucky statistics, which for, for us, knowing that we've seen like all the statistics, that these are some of the highest rates uh, as far as a factor that, that informs whether or not uh, Black women are going to be having kids, I think is, is, a, is a big deal that, that we just really can't, um, you know, ignore. So I think just, to, but to answer your question, Carlise, um, we're, we're not taking care of ourselves as Black women. We're taking care of our families. We're taking care of elder parents. You know, uh, that's definitely something that, that's a responsibility of mine. I've inherited my grandmother because my mother is deceased, but my mother made health decisions of whether to live or die based on not wanting to impact our family financially with her health care needs as she navigated liver disease. And so, you know, this is not, we're not an anomaly in my family, right? We're, we're not an anomaly uh, in the South. This is what folks are doing every day. Um, so we're making health care decisions uh, based on not having you know access to proper health care our children might be on the state insurance but we may not be insured right and if you live in, in my state your kids may have gotten kicked off of the of the state insurance right so you know these are the, the decisions that black women continue to make um and i'm very concerned also about the ways that uh if we're if we even consider um you know even LGBT care, right? Something that else that you lifted up. Um, the fact that there isn't access for folks who are queer identified without shame, without blame. If you're a trans man, which means you can still have children, um, you know, there's, there's lack of care. There's lack of opportunities for you to get the care that you need. Um, and so we're, you know, it, when we're making decisions, whether or not we're black women or women of color across the South, and especially in the state of Kentucky, we're making these decisions based on access based on support or, or the lack thereof. So I'll stop there and let somebody else uh, speak. Thank you so much for that. Representative Scott, how are local officials, particularly Black women in the state legislature here in Kentucky and perhaps elsewhere in the Deep South responding to the apparent disregard for Black women's reproductive health and reproductive oppression in the context of COVID-19 and state violence amidst Breonna Taylor's death. How does this polling data appeal to you and your mission for social and economic change? What connections do you see? Thank you, I appreciate that question. Uh, thank you to Sister Reach for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. It's an honor to join Aaron and Michela. And I definitely wanna share with you my uh, thoughts on the data and also my experience as the only black woman in our state legislative body. During my first term as a state representative, uh, legislation to lift up hardworking Kentucky families and address issues like police violence stagnated in the Kentucky Capitol while my colleagues ran through another arbitrary abortion ban. 
And I feel like every year that I've been there it has been the same attack on our bodily autonomy. So we have failed to address the real issues and problems that we as black people, and in particular, in particular, that black women face. And the polling data shows that. So I, I just feel like it's um, a direct reflection on what I see every single day when I'm in community with the folks that I serve. And so, of course, 80% of women surveyed support Roe v. Wade. We want to make our own reproductive health decisions. And of course, financial security and insecurity has an influence on a woman's decision to bear children, especially when there is a 67 cent wage gap for Black women in Kentucky. 67 cent and the legislature refuses to address pay equity, refuses to weigh, uh, raise the wage. And of course, young women between the ages of 18 to 34 stated that over-policing factored into their decision to give birth. As Black mothers, we bear the weight of bringing children into a world where police can murder them with impunity. And of course, 54% of women stated that racism has a negative effect on emotional and mental health. I see those effects every time I'm out at Injustice Square Park, raising my fist and raising my voice with good people seeking justice for Breonna Taylor. As politicians, our job is to address the barriers that keep Black people from thriving in our commonwealth. We must pay living wages. No one should live paycheck to paycheck or no check to no check. Not one of my colleagues would serve in office if they were making $7.25 an hour. We must address racism in healthcare, and that's why I filed the Maternal Care Act. With Black women being three to four times more likely to die in childbirth, we must answer this clear call to action. And I appreciate you, Michelle, for being my partner in that work. But we also need to address issues of housing, especially affordable housing, and in this global pandemic when people are being evicted because they are jobless and aren't able to pay their rent. Louisville's eviction rate is twice the national average. That is shameful. People are hungry, they're jobless. We have work to do in Kentucky. Childcare is expensive. I know when my kids were in childcare, it was almost like paying rent twice for them to be in childcare and my own rent. And of course we must address over-policing of black people and our communities. The fact that my teenage daughter and I were arrested together seeking justice for Breonna Taylor is just another example of how over-policed we are no matter what we do, including simply walking to a church for shelter and sanctuary. So as the first black woman to serve in our legislature in nearly 20 years and as the only black woman currently serving, I know that there is work to do and that's why I filed Breonna's Law for Kentucky to make sure that we are addressing the issue of these no-knock death warrants, to make sure that police are held accountable. I don't want another mother like Tamika Palmer to have to mourn the loss of her baby girl. That should not happen anywhere in this commonwealth, so we must take action. So I am ready. Uh, I'm looking forward to the policy recommendations that y'all end up sharing with us, and I will be a champion, continue to be a champion for the reproductive uh, autonomy and freedom of Black women in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Thank you so much, Representative Scott. We appreciate the work that you're doing in Kentucky. Erin, as a Black woman in the South, I myself cannot deny the history and its display of hardships that have been imposed on my people based off of the color of our skin. With the current political climate, the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the outcry of many Black mothers for peace and present day health disparities shown with the novel coronavirus. How does this polling data appeal to you and your mission at the Kentucky Health Justice Network? Thank you so much for that question and it is an honor to be here. Um, so I wanna do my best to condense that because I mean, it can be, a, it's just so much to try to absorb, especially with the passing of um, Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But with you know the Kentucky Health Justice Network, we have been you know trying to do our best in providing you know abortion support, uh, trans health advocacy, and you know access to abortion and reproductive care in rural parts of Kentucky. But with all the changes that we have seen, it's just making us more inclusive of um, more Black communities and Black women. You know, I started this position in May and one of my um, 
biggest platforms that I came in on is that I want to expand our reach to touch all parts of not just Louisville, but all parts of the state, because we do see this, you know, attack on black people, men, women, trans individuals, especially, um, that has continued into 2020. And it's just made our work that much more important. So, you know, Right now, what we're seeing with the coronavirus, an increase of support calls into our hotline. And that is because, not just because of coronavirus, but because we're seeing a large multitude of people asking for assistance from our national organizations and they just can't bear the weight. So we're having to come in and put more of our funding and more of our time and consideration into all of these calls and we're getting them from everywhere. Um, with the results that you know have been shared in this conversation, you know we're fighting for our lives. Black people are fighting for our lives, and we have been for a very long time. But especially um, now, with the passing of of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we're feeling like you know we lost someone who was in our corner in the area of reproductive care, and trying to make sure that K. Cheyenne continues not just providing support, but providing education as well, and making sure that people have access to this organization. Um, you know, I could say that, you know, it's tough and it's, it's overwhelming, but this is the same fight that I've watched my mother fight um, when she was raising me and being able to learn under her and her tutelage um, and to take up this fight again. It's just, you know, part of what we have to do, have had to do as a people. And, you know, I, I don't know how, you know, what else I can add to that, you know, what else I can add to what Representative Scott said and Ms. And Ms. Cherie Scott said, um, except for the just, you know, it's one of those things where we just have to keep working and pushing, but working to take care of ourselves. I mean, we're making decisions based on survival. We're making decisions whether or not to have a family based on how we feel we can survive or even raise our children in a safe uh, and supportive environment. It's really hard to try to make a decision to start a family when you're seeing mothers and parents burying their children due to police violence. It's hard to make decisions when you can't afford housing, when you are living in a food desert or a food apartheid really because you know, lack of access to groceries. And we see it a lot here in Louisville. And with everything that has gone on, I will say that I applaud all of the organizations that have really come up and to the plate and started supporting communities here in Louisville. The 501c3 community has grown, but it's also in the midst of our struggle, we have become so much more interwoven with each other because, with each other. because whether it is housing justice or, you know, food, you know, addressing the food shortages or addressing um, abortion support, everything has fallen to the umbrella of justice because all of these things bring it together for us because in order to have justice fully, each of these individual lanes must first be addressed. And that's one way I think the Kentucky Health Justice Network has really been called on to step up and we are continuing to do that. And, um, despite the virus, you know, I think that's just an adversity that, you know, it's here, we have to deal with it. We're not going to let it slow us down or stop us in any way. Um, so looking to make our organization as accessible as possible uh, because accessibility has continued to be a problem and an unaddressed problem within our state and within our city. Thank you, Erin. We appreciate the work that you're doing in Kentucky as well. Michaela, why do you think it's important to center the voices of Black women and ensure that they are involved in the conversations that affect their health status and reproductive decision making? How does the reproductive justice framework and this data inform your work as a reproductive justice lawyer? What can you share with us from the legal perspective about the landscape in Kentucky? Well, oh, geez, I got a loaded question there. <laughs> um, first, let me just say that um, there is no reproductive rights, reproductive health victory if reproductive justice is not at the, at the center of that, right? Like there is no victory that we see in this world where Black women and women of color are still um, making 67 cents to the dollar, are still feeling like they are having to make choices of survival, like Erin said, um, rather than choices that 
people are just making freely. Like we deserve the right to truly live our best lives. And that includes an intersectional review of how everything impacts what we do. Because black women, and I do use that term very inclusively, are still the most unprotected person in this world. Um, and we see this because, of course, I read Megan The Stallion's article in the New York Times, because, and I was so excited. I love Megan The Stallion. One, because she embodies that stereotypical of what Black womanhood means, of what white people continue to perpetuate, of what a Black woman uh, looks like, and that we see from, from times of like the um, video vixens and all of those and the J uh, Josephine Bakers. Yet, this is a, a rapper who still, one, is very much educated and continues to use her platform to speak up for Black women and to not be shameful of that. Um, so since I'm the last panelist, I do want to just bring some type of hope because we, we take this polling data and we see um, these numbers and it can almost make you feel like a, a sense of like this hope, like there is no hope, like what is it that we still need to do. But I would say that this racial reckoning that we are experiencing, not only in Kentucky, but in this world is opening up gates, is, is getting past those folks who continue to like try to safe keep and, and uh, safeguard those platforms and are allowing black women to step up into those spaces. Um, so it's important to include black women into, into the conversation because we've seen across movements, including the civil rights movement, that black women will be pushed to the side, right? Like we will continue to be discounted and ignored, but yet do all the background work. Black women are always there for everybody else. And yet we are still standing to say who is there for us. So it's important that when we talk about these decisions that we ask the people who are directly impacted. State legislators are making these decisions and they don't even go talk to their constituents. Their constituents include black women. Black women win elections, but people ignore that because in their minds, they still like are going with this racial um, racism impediment in their mind that black women don't matter until the polls come and then everybody wants to come to our church, right? Everybody wants to come to the organization events. Everybody wants to say whatever it is, but black women aren't stupid either. So we recognize when people are truly for what we want and what we need in our communities and those who are truly listening and those who are just trying to pass the buck to someone else. And so in the legal landscape, um, I know COVID-19 has been a very tough year for a lot of people across the world. But in terms of reproductive rights um, and reproductive justice in Kentucky, it actually helped because no abortion laws were passed, right? Like the ACLU, we tend to bring those cases in. We didn't have to file a lawsuit last year. And that was the first time in at least since 2016 since we have not filed a suit. So in a very weird way, thank you, COVID-19, but I still need you to go because I would like to get back to life. <laughs> Um, but thinking about the legal landscape and what we see, what the bills that were brought up, we continue to see that abortion is being attacked on all fronts. Um, and the representatives who are doing these, of course, one, we recognize that they are following other states. So they're following Indiana. They're following some of the stuff that's happened in Tennessee. They're following this push to do more restrictive um, abortion bills and then continuing to ignore bills like the one that Representative Scott has been working on for maternal mortality. Like they don't want to combine those two. Um, and so I would say that, especially for the work that I do at the ACLU, recognizing that it is a majority white-led organization that has been for a very long time, but stepping into that space as a black woman with a law degree and working with Jackie, who's our reproductive rights uh, policy strategist. And we have been working to open that door to what it means to advocate for reproductive rights in the state of Kentucky to where people aren't just continuing to hear from Planned Parenthood, though they've done great work. Like it's, it's all about stepping up and learning when to step back. And there are people in the community, in the community that since have been learning are ready and engaged to do this work. And so we've been really trying to open up the work that we do, doing it in a reproductive justice framework and allowing more people, especially black women and women of color to step into this space, to gain their dignity, to, to have that sense of I'm in control of what happens in my life and the represent, and I'm going to step into this space and not allow the representatives of Kentucky to ignore me and my plight of this world. Um, so really just being intentional about what it means. We know that Kentucky has always been a very hostile state to abortion, but that doesn't mean that the fight will stop. We will continue to work, just as Aaron said, and Representative Scott and Sharice, like continuing to work to combat these because we will not be silenced and we will not allow Black people to continue to live in this state where we have to feel like we are making choices of survival rather than living our best lives.
Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm so glad to hear that the ACLU had a little break because of COVID-19. Um, it's always good to hear positive things in the midst of the virus. I would like to thank all of our panelists. Your comments were insightful and provided a unique perspective from your personal experience on how it is important to listen to Black women. Now we will open the floor for questions by the audience. Okay, we got our first question in. I'm going to give this question to Representative Scott. What is at stake with this election for Black women? How are we mobilizing to get our communities to the polls? Everything is at stake for Black women, but everything always is, right? Um, we'll hear people say this is the most important election of your life every time, and every election is the most important election of our lives as Black women. Um, regardless of who is on the ballot, if I'm going to be honest with you, because even my own political party of choice has failed us as Black women time and time again. So we've got to make sure that we're holding every single candidate that's on our ballot to count for us, to make sure that they have a racial justice agenda, that they are centering our issues. Uh, I'm not interested in, and I know a whole lot of people who aren't interested in the conversation that says, well, you know, let's just wait till they get in office, because once they're in office, there's a lot that they can do. Well, I don't know what you can do if you haven't told me along your campaign trail. So we have to make sure that we're holding them accountable. And I will say that there's so much good work happening right now um, here in Louisville and across Kentucky to get Black people, in particular uh, Black women, to the polls. But I'm also going to be honest, um, we don't actually have an issue getting Black women to the polls in Louisville and Kentucky. We always show up. We know how to handle our business politically uh, and to make sure that we cast our ballots and teach our children to do the same. If you saw the video on primary election day here in Kentucky, you saw that a Black woman with her daughter, her Black daughter, were the ones in front banging on the door to get in to vote. So you don't have to, you know, necessarily um, be concerned with us showing up. And so that's why we're doing the work of making sure that our brothers and uncles and cousins and nephews and grandpa are showing up to vote. We've got rides to the polls. We're doing educational forums and seminars on the ballot amendments uh, that are in front of us. We're making sure that folks watch these debates with our local and state and federal candidates so that they are well informed. But we're also encouraging people continue to hold these folks feet to the fire. Don't just give them a photo op and then you're not part of their agenda. Thank you for that. Michelle, this one is for you. What's being done to mobilize and energize the youth to vote? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was on mute and I wasn't. Um, I think that's a very good question. And I know that I had a conversation um, about this with Councilwoman Dorsey. Um, and really, I would say, when, even when we think about the protests that are being led here in Louisville, we don't necessarily have an issue with our youth right now either. Um, our youth are, are literally using their voices and their platforms, including TikTok, which I still myself do not understand. But I continue to see different forms of, are you voting? Are you going to be the voice? Have you watched this? Like, they are the ones who are um, pushing the presidential debates. They are the one who are pushing the candidates and their missions and are really active, are really being active in our community. Um, but I will say still too, there's still a lot of cultivating that needs to be done, right? Because the State Board of Elections here in Kentucky continues to pass regulations and they don't do a good job of informing people of ways of what it looks like to vote. They don't know, like um, we did a, a big push to let people know that yesterday was the first day to go vote um, in person, like um, letting, it, letting folks know what it means to have the correct ID. And I think there's been a really big push to get youth involved and being youth and being poll workers, which we haven't seen in the past. I know that I was never necessarily pursued to be a poll worker, but since COVID-19 has hit, we know that a lot of the poll workers tend to be of older generations. And this is a time where youth who aren't able to vote just yet can still be politically active in this particular election. Um, and I think it's a very, very great um, asset to have. And it really um, allows you to one, meet candidates one-on-one, -on -one, to be involved in what it means to vote, to see the process themselves, um, even if they see something wrong, right? Like they are still more likely to step up and say, actually, 
this is this is the correct form or actually they are still allowed to vote because they themselves will educate and youth are never scared i feel like to ask questions once that activism has been um lighted within them they are very much open and ready to do the work so i think it's more of what are we doing to support youth who want to be involved right like not so much what are we doing to uh, initiate that youth vote, but what are we as organizations doing to make sure that they have the resources and the support that they need to do the work that they want to do thank you so much sharice as activists within the movement, how can we use data like this to enhance advocacy efforts? Absolutely. I think it's important for us to be able to say, this is what Black women are thinking. This is what, um, or whomever the subject, you know, the, the participants uh, uh, might have been. I think it's important to make sure that there is data out there that we can point to as fact and say that this is what folks are thinking. One of the things that I did mention earlier that I, I thought was really important to mention now is the ways that Black women of faith responded to the poll, right? Especially in, a, in a, uh, an area of the country where we're all working and living in the Bible Belt and white evangelical uh, fascism <laughs> would allow us all to believe that, you know, we're all grappling uh, you know, with having, make, you know, making decisions to have abortions, for example, and that that's an issue because of our faith, or that Black women are making decisions because we're not people of faith. But clearly that this data shows, which is, I think, would be a very key organizing tool or piece of, uh, to use among folks who, uh, you know, may have some type of, be on the, on the uh, margins about how they're going to um, support abortion care access or just abortion care period, depending on their faith. Clearly, Black women in, in Kentucky don't believe that abortion care is a religious issue. Clearly, Black women in Kentucky feel like abortion care is a responsible choice versus having babies that they cannot afford or being put into a situation uh, of having, being forced to have a baby because of rape or, or incest or molestation. We're still, you know, we, we talk about this in the context of women, but we can never forget about girls, right? that it's not just grown women getting pregnant it's, it's little girls getting pregnant too right so i think that these types of you know, data is important to be able to mobilize and educate our communities uh let them know that hey you're not alone this isn't just your thought process or the process of thought process of your family but that this is something that black women across the state believe this is this is the way that we're all trying to um address navigating reproductive health care decisions, whether we're going to have a child or not have a child. I think the maternal health piece is important. I think any data that's coming out of the ways in which uh, uh, Black mothers are, you know, navigating preeclampsia, having miscarriages, having children born with low birth weight, all of those factors matter and can be used to mobilize our folks to the polls and mobilize our people on the ground for even local elections, which are extremely important. So, uh, um, I definitely think that, that that's something that we need to all be thinking about, and hopefully this polling data was helpful for the work that Aaron and Michelle and Representative Scott are doing on the ground as well. Thank you so much. Aaron. what are you going to do within your role to help gain support and engage women who are beyond childbearing age or reproductive years that are not necessarily thinking that this work relates to them? I think everything ties back to education. You know, it just because someone is beyond years or is not able to have, you know, children doesn't mean that one, it doesn't affect them, and two, that they can't be a part of education, uh, of educating next generations or, you know, being a part of the movement now. I think um, in the area of reproductive justice, there are several hills that are trying to be. Uh, trying to get over right now and one is stop seeing reproductive, reproductive justice as white women wearing uh, pink hats you know and that's something that I, I think the media has shown a lot of but we have to get you know older generations talking about it I know that's conversations that I've had with older women in my family talking about hey you know I didn't have access to this that the other when I was you know 16 years old in the 70s and we're still having those conversations about lack of accessibility and 
um, in, in communities, which goes to show that in terms of advancement, we really haven't advanced that far, at least advanced as far as we should be, especially in Black areas, especially in Black neighborhoods and communities, right? So I think, you know, sharing those stories and sharing those narratives of what previous generations have gone through can further ignite a spark in younger generations and younger people, especially, you know, like, oh, you went through that, I'm going through that now, why am I still going through that now, and then looking to solve those issues. I think that is something that um, needs to happen. And it's just, you know, another area of reproductive justice that goes into educating former generations, the inclusion of trans and non-binary people in the conversations of reproductive justice, especially since Black trans women face so much violence and so much adversity. And as Michelle said previously, Black women, no matter identity, um, are the most disrespect disrespected and face the most violence out of any other population um, outside of Indigenous women, right? So I think what should be happening, and I feel like this is a role that KHJN is going to be playing, is just bringing multiple generations of Black people together, Black persons, uh, female identified, and women together to have these conversations, intergenerational conversations, to further push current issues within reproductive justice and abortion access, because that's another hill too, is, you know, reproductive justice, it's not just about abortion, abortion is healthcare, it is a part of reproductive justice, but then there's everything that involves access to doctors, access to pregnancy care, post-pregnancy care, mental health for postpartum depression, and so many other things that fall, right? We have to not change the narrative, but be more inclusive within that narrative that reproductive justice spans across so many different lines, right? And it includes all the age groups, because as long as you're living and in the body that you are in, and uh, it affects you, right? And that's something that I think the more that, you know, we as an organization put out there and the more conversations we have, you know, with our elders and our mothers and our grandmothers and our sisters and aunties, then that is, those are things that we can continue to, to spread and, and learn from each other so that we can support each other and build each other up. Because I don't know where I would be if I didn't have my mentors and people behind me supporting me and educating me along the way. Um, even if it's you know through telling stories, which I think narratives have the largest effect on you know just learning experiences in general. Thank you so much for that. I think it is important that, you know, educa we educate our communities and we break the cycle of what's been going on so long in Black history alone. I'm going to go back to you, Representative Scott. Is there a concern about Black men going out to the polls? Um, there's work that's happening to make sure that they um, are showing up to vote. So a strong push for the absentee ballot so folks can stay healthy and safe with COVID-19 um, and an encouragement that if you do um, feel like you need to go in person because of the attacks that the person in the White House is making on the Postal Service, then um, do so in a healthy and safe way. We have uh, in Justice Square Park, which is the epicenter of the movement for justice for Breonna Taylor. Uh, there was a strong uh, voter registration movement going on there for months. Uh, so lots of folks got registered and there are a lot of black men who are there at Injustice Square Park. We have groups like Cities United and Russell A Place of Promise um, that is a, a, a neighborhood-based organization that have been working and continue to work to make sure that not only are black men um, showing up to vote, know about the issues and the candidates, but also that they complete the census so that we can be counted, that we can all be counted and get the money that we need for our community. So we know that um, the movement is about voting, but also completing that census. Thank you so much for that. Um, as we are beginning to close out, I want to give each of you all at least one minute to add any of your final thoughts, takeaways that, you know, our participants can use. Um, people that are watching or will be watching from the live stream, is there anything else that you would like to leave them with? And you all can just decide who you want to, who wants to go ahead and kick it off. I'll jump on so I can let the folks in Kentucky have the last word. Um, we just want to thank everyone who um, 
watched on and uh, we definitely want to thank all of you who participated in Kentucky. We appreciate your leadership in, in being here. And I want to really lift up the importance of supporting these Black women that it is important to lift up their leadership, center their leadership, work on trying to make sure that Representative Scott is not the only lone black woman legislator in the state of Kentucky holding it down for an entire community of people that I'm sure that she represents more than just black people, right? And understanding that the needs of, of but understanding that the needs of black people are her center and making sure that we get the type of representation that we all need uh, in the state of Kentucky. Uh, but definitely we wanna make sure that she's got some support. So definitely uh, continue to uh, show up at these polls and support the work that's happening on the ground in Kentucky. And Sister Reach is here to, to support you all and any way that we absolutely can. And we thank you so much for leading the charge and continuing to do this amazing, uh, unapologetic work for, your, for our people. Appreciate you. Michelle, any last words? <laughs> <laughs> I know we're all just sitting here looking like, she's gonna go first. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I would just like to say thank you so much to Sister Reach and In Our Own Voice for doing um, this work truly um, outside of maternal mortality um, rates that we've since gotten, um, I believe last year. I don't even think there's anything like this that exists. Um, and I know the folks at the ACLU were all over it. So please don't, I mean, please know that um, this work was very, very meaningful and will be used in the work that we do here in Kentucky. Um, and if there's anything that we can do to help you all in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and like I said, I just wanted to just remind folks on this call that even though we continue this fight, that there are pockets of hope within this movement. Um, um, and Black women have never been defeated. We continue to push past everything and every block that continues to be an obstacle for us. Um, and I know that one of the quotes that I had from um, Megan Thee Stallion was like, uh, Black women are there for everybody else. And who is there for Black women? Black women are there for Black women. And we continue to support and uplift each other to get through this movement. So this work will always continue. We will always be there to uh, be a voice for the communities that we represent. Erin? Um, I just you know want to take a moment to just encourage people to vote. Encourage your loved ones to vote, people you know on the street, just say, hey, did you vote today? Were you able to vote today? But not just voting, but if people have capacity to do more, find something you're passionate about and do more. We need volunteers, we need people doing the groundwork. You know, none of us here on this panel just got here. We've, you know, we all had moments where we were just starting. We were just finding interest and finding our passions. And I want to encourage everyone to find your interest and find your passion and don't be afraid to dive in. Take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, reach out to us or someone that you admire or you aspire to be and ask, you know, where you can start and just to get your foot into the door. Um, and, you know, look at resources, you know, Sister Reach, I thank you all so much for having me here. Um, and I, you know, I'll be remiss if, you know, if you want to talk more about reproductive justice, especially in red Southern states, our Take Root conference is coming up and you can find out more information at KentuckyHealthJusticeNetwork.org um, on our Take Root conference tab. And we will just be discussing, you know, every pretty much a large portion of what we've been discussing here plus the vote so that's really where i want to to leave it at and, and encourage people just like don't be intimidated um this is not the time <laughs> to be intimidated or afraid you know you have people in your corner always and just you know we'll help you get your foot in the door thank you so much for that representative scott any last words Yes, thank you so much. Uh, appreciation to y'all for um, amplifying Kentucky and lifting up uh, the voices of people right here in the Commonwealth. Appreciate you for that. I just want to say, please continue to use your voice in seeking justice for Breonna Taylor. 
reproductive justice is racial justice. She, in one of her uh, last tweets in 2019, she said she was looking forward to being a mama and she never had that chance ever. So as you are raising your voice for her, know that you're raising your voice for other black women who have been taken too soon. So I encourage folks, if you have not yet, please sign on as a community co-sponsor of Rihanna's Law for Kentucky. You can do a, a Google search and find out how to do that. And please continue uh, the good work of connecting reproductive justice and racial justice, because that's how we will get free and that's how we will move forward in a way that centers all of us and particularly Black women in our experiences. Well, as I close you all out, I would just like to thank you all so much for joining us. A special thanks to the panelists. We really appreciate the groundwork that you're doing to uplift Black women in the Deep South. For more information, follow Sister Reach at Sister Reach and in our own voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda at Black Women SRJ. You all have a wonderful day. It was great being your moderator and we look forward to doing and getting into good trouble. Have a good one. Bye y'all. Take care.